Uh, well, actually, I'm going to be a little more specific than, um, than Klaus had indicated, but at the end, I'll come back to some general things. I want to think of the effects of thinning on carbon stores and forests. And uh, this talk is about carbon. There are uh, many objectives for thinning forests, uh, but I'm looking at the carbon-related ones. And it's, it's actually, um, what's got me thinking about it is this statement from an EPA publication, which they're making recommendations of practices that will increase carbon stores of sequestration in forests. And we look at this, it says thinning can reduce fire risk. Well, that's possible. And uh, stimulate growth that over time increases the carbon stores. So it implies that thinning forests is going to increase their carbon stores. And I want to ask a couple of questions here. Does thinning a forest really increase the forest production at the ecosystem level? We have to remember that carbon is an ecosystem currency, and we first have to think about it as an ecosystem, the sum of ecosystem processes. So is that true? And does the thinning actually increase the store in the forest? And if not, then why is this a major policy recommendation? My concern is, has always been in the forest sector, that there have been a number of policy recommendations made through the years that run counter to actually storing more carbon in forests. And the result of this is actually to undermine the forest sector in terms of the role that it could play. And I do actually believe it could play a significant role, but if these ideas continuously get to the fore and they're not, they're proven to be wrong, I'm afraid the credibility is being eroded. So, first of all, let's think about where this idea might have come from. Well, when we thin trees in a forest, we actually free resources up. And the remaining trees get the access to those resources, so they grow faster. We know that. There are dramatic indications of that. That's not what I'm arguing about. Um, we also, in many cases, can produce more wood down, going down to the mill. So that, in a way, is a forest production. So if we can increase that production, we must increase the carbon stores. The problem is, though, is we have a miscommunication on what production means in terms of carbon. We've got to remember the buts, which is that the total growth is a function of not only individual growth, but the number of individuals. If we thin, we have fewer individuals. That offsets the greater growth of individuals. And the other thing is, we have to remember when we harvest wood, we're removing carbon from an ecosystem. When we remove something from an ecosystem, it stores less. So both of these points indicate that maybe we have a little bit of a problem here. So let's quickly go over how the forest system works. This is sort of a very simple diagram, but I show it to people of all levels because, frankly, they don't seem to understand this too well. We have outside the system, and it comes in through photosynthesis, and then outside losses through respiration and combustion. And depending on how you arrange it, harvest of timber is either within the forest sector, that's what's shown here, but it's certainly outside the forest ecosystem. So let's think about some ecosystem basics. The average store in any forest is a function of two simultaneous processes, input and output. The input is in the form of net prior production. It's not in the form of what goes to the mill. It's actually what's left over from net photosynthesis. And the output is in the form of heterotrophic respiration. Those are the decomposers and consumers like ourselves. And then the harvest removal. So those are the ins and the outs. I want to talk about the average store and why I talk about the average store. Because if we run a simulation model or we observe rotations through time, we tend to see the following. We see this recurring pattern of increase and decrease, but it's oscillating about a mean. And it doesn't matter what our rotation interval is. This should come up soon. Um, we see the same sort of recurring intervals. And if we average the, or see the line that it's going about, we get these kinds of results. These are the mean carbon stores of the system. So even though carbon is coming in and out of the system and we have disturbances, we can talk about a mean store and, and therefore it simplifies the problem. Back to our ecosystem basics. 
we'll actually know that the average carbon stored in a system is a function of two things. How much is coming in divided by K, which is the proportion that's leaking out of the system. This is what controls how much we have. And K is basically determined by heterotrophic respiration and harvest divided by the amount of carbon in the system. That gives us that proportion. And what does that tell us? It tells us that thinning harvest in general is going to decrease net primary production. That's because it takes time for the forest to regenerate its photosynthetic machinery. This does not happen instantaneously. Trees don't suddenly pop out their branches to claim more space or their roots. It just takes time. And it also increases the proportional loss from the ecosystem. So if we decrease the amount that's coming in, or we increase the proportion going out, we have to have less. We cannot have more. And if we simultaneously decrease the amount that's going in and the proportion going out, we have to lower the store. There's no two ways about it. So let's look at some data. And actually, the, the amazing thing is how little actual empirical data there is on this. It's really amazing. There's maybe a few publications. But here's one. It was in the Journal of Forestry that looked at a black cherry sugar maple system. And this looks at a control. I can't tell if this is in focus or not. It's not for me. But basically, um, that has 53 uh, tons of carbon per acre. And then we have various thinning. And this includes what's in the live, the dead wood. I uh, can't quite see from here if it's the soil. Slash, I don't think it's soil, but it has products. And so what we see is that uh, only in one case where we thin from below do we have more carbon stores. Now, of course, this is the mean. There must have been average, uh, variation in the stands. So it's, I, I have a question of whether this is really a significant difference. But the form of thinning we, we uh, conduct does have an impact. And, and essentially, by thinning by below, we take out less. And that has less of an impact than if we thin from above. And there could be some marginal benefits of thinning, but they're not major. Another study, which doesn't really look at it that way, but looks at how, what carbon storage was after various residual amounts of carbon. This was for yellow poplar by uh, Kieser, recently published. This is the remaining basal area uh, shown here, so it gets higher to the right. And this is for total tree biomass, I believe, uh, above ground biomass. What we see, this is right after the thinning occurred, and we have as we have thinned more, we have less carbon. That makes sense. And then the different dots, this is uh, uh, 20 years later, and this is after the treatment, and this is 35 years. And what we see is a series of parallel lines. So it's true that if we thin, we reduce the carbon. Uh, in time, we gain more carbon. But these are basically parallel lines. If thinning really increased carbon stores, wouldn't we expect something like this to happen over time? where basically these were not parallel lines, they'd be lifting. We don't see that. So this really questions the whole idea that we could, by thinning, increase the carbon store in the forest. OK, so what I'm going to show you is some modeling results here. This is from the online calculator. You can uh, do these things yourself. You can very easily run experiments. So let me show you some results of that. And this looks at a stand, two stands. They're harvested every 50 years with a clear cut. And uh, the red line shows a stand that's thinned at year 25. And I think 25% of the live mass is taken out at that time. And we see that, and this is total carbon stores in the soil and in the dead stuff and in the live stuff. So what we see is that if we thin, we actually have less carbon, actually 13% uh, less in the simulation. Well, why is that? Well, this is what the model predicts for our net prime production. The blue line shows unthinned, and the red shows thinned. And we see what's happening. We're, de we're decreasing the net primary photosynthesis, NPP. is depleted for a while, decreased for a while. It bounces back, but it takes time. And this actually leads to 11% uh, production into the system. By thinning, we do reduce the amount of decomposition losses. So it's 10% less. Uh, we have less stuff to decompose. Instead of dying and decomposing, it's, die, it's being cut and then harvested. 
But when we look at the overall balance of things, we see that NPP was reduced when we thinned, uh, respiration was decreased, the harvest remains about the same in these simulations. The proportional loss when we thin is higher by 5%. And overall, we end up with a 15% less carbon store. This is totally in lines with ecosystem theory. This is an example looking at uh, the same thing, only with a 100-year interval of harvest, uh, thinning at you know, 25, 50, and 75. And here we can see more dramatic effects, the, a greater decline in the amount of carbon that's accumulated in the thin versus unthin. Let's look at the same sort of balance thing. We, deplete, we decrease net prime production by 23%. Uh, we do decrease respiration because we don't have much, as much decomposing. We get a little less in harvest, probably because we're affecting the, the number of trees at the end that are there. The proportional loss is much higher. It's actually 20% higher. And in this case, it's actually 36% less carbon stored in that forest. So with results like these, you know, I really have to wonder about this EPA policy. Is it just my model? Maybe my model is very suspect. We may find another model. So this is one based on the forest vegetation simulator, the work that uh, Nunnery and Keaton did in the, the Northeast. And it looks at a series of stands. They start at the same condition. And then they're allowed to just grow with, with no management, so to speak. Uh, they're clear cut in various ways. That decreases the carbon store the most. Or they can do various things like individual tree harvest, and that decreases it less than clear cutting, but there's still a big effect relative to no treatment whatsoever. This is a diagram that shows the same, the results of this, and it actually includes the wood products, so that's often something I hear, well, we're harvesting, but it's going into wood products. Yes, some of it's going into wood products, but not all of it, and wood products have a finite lifespan as well. And what we see is this is not treated, and then we see the totals for all the treatments. They're all lower, and that's because by treating it, we've done two things. We've decreased the NPP, and we've increased the losses from the system. The white bar here is products. So from the forest sector, we haven't totally lost it. Some of it's regained in products. And the more we harvest, the more we have in products, but that does not offset the losses that are incurred by doing it. So let's think about this in a very, very, very general sense, using this idea of the input and output model, this sort of general theoretical framework. And I like to tell people about it because, you know, it's a very simple relationship that's incredibly powerful. Now, this is a model that has thousands and thousands of lines of code, and I've averaged the amount of carbon that can be stored in that system. It includes the ecosystem carbon and things like soil trees and dead trees and needles and things, and also the products. So it doesn't neglect the products. It includes those as well. And what would be the average store that that system could maintain over time? And it looks at two things. One is the rotation interval. And what we see is that as the rotation interval goes up, we store more. Why is that? We're creating a less leaky system. We have leaks, but we don't have as many leaks. So it will store more. But we also see these lines here, and this is different amounts removed. So this is if we took all the live, uh, at least the stem. Uh, this is if we took uh, 80%, uh, 60, uh, 40, and 20. And what we see is that as we create smaller leaks, that is, we take less each time, we store more. And that's completely in line with the theory that I've been outlining here about inputs and outputs. Um, now. Is thinning always bad? No, I'm not trying to say that. It's always relative to something. So if we, if we have a system that isn't managed, uh, we actually store more carbon if we don't thin. But if we have a system where we're clear cutting and removing all the trees, well, actually thinning or partial harvest could be beneficial because what it does is it decreases the leakiness of the system relative to this, and therefore we have a gain. So we have a lot of opportunities here, how we could manage forests. We can uh, basically 
have them managed on longer rotations, or we could actually change the way we harvest and take less each time, and that could also increase stores and probably could do it a lot faster, frankly, than waiting 200 years or so. So I'm not saying that we shouldn't manage forests, but we have to be aware of the ecosystem dynamics that underline carbon storage. If we're not aware of that, we're going to set up policies like this EPA thinning policy that are just counterproductive, eventually you're going to be revealed, and then the trust in the whole forest sector just evaporates. Okay, so conclusions here. Thinning is highly likely to reduce the carbon stores in forests relative to no thinning. Okay? That's been shown over and over again in simulation studies. In fact, Canal and Dewar in England showed, you know, uh, the system they looked at was a spruce system, Sika spruce system, and they found a 15% decrease relative to no thinning. And that included products, by the way. Um, however, Partial harvest, they can actually increase the storms relative to complete harvest. So it's not one way or the other, but we have to be aware of what our reference is. Now, more empirical results are definitely needed. I mean, it's really amazing how little is out there on this topic, and I'm hoping people like yourselves will, will look at the kinds of experiments that have been going on and, and give us better answers based on the empirical data. Uh, but what we've got to do is stop looking at it from the individual tree scale. We already know that thinning increases individual tree growth in general. We don't have to prove that anymore. But what we have to do is figure out on a whole stand or ecosystem basis what is the net effect. Because we know if we thin too much, we can actually reduce production of volume to the mill. And the other thing is, we've got to look at more than just the live part of the system. The, the dead part doesn't act like the live part does. It's not a parallel set of curves. And so it would really be great. Maybe we won't be able to do things like soil, but certainly the dead wood could be added into these analyses to give us a better sense. And I think also it's a good idea to look at what the fate of that harvested material is to see what happens in the other parts of the forest sector to see if that makes a difference. Because it doesn't all just disappear into the atmosphere. Some of it is stored for some period of time, and that can offset losses in the ecosystem. With that, I'd like to open the floor to any comments or questions. I think we have a little less than 10 minutes to do so. Thank you. I could, but that's a transient thing. Um, what happens is a system will go from one state to another. And so early on, there could be um, fairly large gains. But in time, they don't, they're not maintained. So the problem with answering that is it, it really depends on how long since the treatment. Um, so what I prefer to do, actually, uh, if I can get back there, is, is actually talk about the potential of moving from here to here. What would be the total gain over time? Now we can talk about how long it would take. Um, generally it's going to take at least as long as uh, it takes to impose sort of a, a, um, a regulated system to, to totally impose that. And sometimes it takes several rotations actually to get the system into a new balance. But you know, within a rotation, we could get a lot of the changes. So it really depends on the rotation interval that you're establishing. So it's really impossible to give me actual numbers. But you know, I can tell you that if we go from this system to that one, we don't have much gain. It's going to possibly take us a long time to implement it. So therefore, its net rate of uptake you know, initially has got to be small. This one. 
uh, might be installed pretty quickly, and it has a big gain. So likely that's going to have a high uptake rate. But we can't talk about a constant uptake rate. It makes no sense in this context of this dynamic system, because that's always changing. And in time, it just gets smaller and smaller, the net uptake gets smaller. That's why these, we can talk about these averages, because in time, it hits a balance, and we have no net uptake. Part of the EPA's uh, recommendation had to do with uh, thinning to reduce fire hazard. And I wondered if you could add a little bit about the carbon consequences of thinning for that reason. Yeah, I didn't talk about that directly today. But um, yeah, we've done some studies on that too. And the problem is that it is true that you can take fuels out of forest and change fire behavior. Uh, that's absolutely true. And we should probably do that for a number of reasons. I kind of doubt the carbon reason, though, because the fuels that we're removing are made of carbon. So what we've done is we've substituted one leak, the loss through the fire, versus a leak via you know, our harvest and use. And it turns out that that leak through harvest and use is much larger than the forest one. Now, this blows people's gourds because we read about it even yesterday about how fires were s primed in the Waniba district to, to burn up acres. Well, they don't burn up acres, otherwise we'd have all these holes all over the earth. Or the earth would be shrinking. What they do is they kill trees and they burn up some of the carbon, but very little of it. And the difference in carbon loss between a fairly light fire and a really severe one is not as great as people think. It's actually quite small. So we are having an effect on the fire behavior and reducing severity potentially, but we're doing it by removing a huge amount of carbon. In some cases, we have to remove 25, 10 to 25 units of carbon to prevent one unit of carbon burning up. So the problem is we can't really get ahead in that system. Now, we could manage for forests for lots of reasons, uh, but if it's for carbon, it actually stores more carbon to let them burn. I know that drives people nuts, but it's, it's just the way it is. In fact, for a fire, if a fire burns, let's think of this relative leakiness. If a fire burns every 10 years and it burns 10% of the carbon in the forest, it burns an average of 1% of the carbon over time. Now, if it burns every 250 years, how much carbon does it have to burn at one time to have the equivalent leakiness? It has to burn 250% of the carbon. How can a forest burn 250% of the carbon? It can't. What do you do, send out for more carbon? We've burned it all, get more? It, the math just doesn't work. So those systems actually store more. They're, highly, they're much more variable through time. There's no doubt about that. But on average, they store more. Um, yeah, I guess what you were just saying there is what I wanted to comment on or, or ask your opinion of. You, you talked about, I'd seen one study where it showed a force that had burned at a fairly high intensity and, you know, man, not a lot of that carbon went in the atmosphere, but it sure did kill a lot of trees. And so, yeah. say you get 90% mortality, you're talking about where is the carbon leaking? Yeah. Uh, you can't ignore the fact that 90% of those trees are decomposing, which is releasing carbon in the atmosphere post-harvest, yeah. post-fire. And so, to say yeah. that... You, you want to manage, so uh, you said a burn forest is better for storing carbon. Well, not if the trees are dead, because they're all rotting and it's all going to the atmosphere anyway. Yeah, but it, I respond by they, they, don't go, they do not go to heaven. I don't have all my joke slides, but I've got one of that where the dead trees ascend into the heavens instantly. They don't do that. It takes hundreds of years for those trees to decompose, and during that time, they're storing carbon. Not as much as if they were not decomposing, but they in fact store carbon. But the decomposition rate is very rapid up front. I mean, you get dead trees, they lay on the ground, they get rained on. There's, it's an exponential reverse J where they're decomposing really fast, a lot yeah. faster than wood products would, uh, you know, under a roof in a, in a building. Well, but the wood, we don't build out of log cabins. We lose, a, a, you know, we don't live in log cabins. We lose a lot of wood when we process it. Actually, we lose about half to the atmosphere. 
Uh, so the idea that we just take the wood and stick it in buildings and it, never, it doesn't decompose, that's, that's a fallacy, I'm sorry. Um, and the decomposition rates of wood in building use and out in the wild are not vastly different, actually. Um, they're, they're not orders of magnitude different. They're slightly different. Depends on where you are. But they're not that different. So the, actually, the system where we harvest is leakier. It's just leakier, and therefore it has to store less. There's, there's not really much alternative to it. Um, sorry. Thank you, Mark.